Hi guys, thanks for joining me again. So today's video is all about limiting factors in photosynthesis. So we're gonna go through some past paper style questions, learn about carbon dioxide, light and temperature, and what stages of photosynthesis they actually limit in detail. And I'm also gonna cover some tricky graph questions with you too, so stay tuned. So limiting factors in photosynthesis really important for biologists to understand because it's going to have a massive impact on one of the most important chemical reactions in the whole of biology. Without photosynthesis, no other animals like us would be able to survive because we either eat plants or we eat animals or consumers that consume plants. So photosynthesis is limited by three key factors. The first one is temperature, then we have light, then we have CO2. Now that is not in a priority order whatsoever because CO2 has the biggest impact. It's often the limiting factor in most setups. So the process of photosynthesis is going to be limited by whichever of these variables is the least optimal. So if we have plenty of temperature and light, but not enough CO2, CO2 will limit. If we have plenty of light and CO2, but very cold temperatures, temperature is going to be the limiting factor. Okay. So even if the other two are in plentiful supply, there will be one factor limiting the rate at which it can occur. Now, as photosynthesis increases, the rate of oxygen production and CO2 absorption also increases because remember, Oxygen is a product of photosynthesis and carbon dioxide is a substrate in photosynthesis. Check out my video on the light independent reaction for more information on that. Now we can measure either oxygen production or CO2 absorption to give us an indication of the rate of photosynthesis. Now, when the amount of oxygen produced and carbon dioxide absorbed, is matched by the carbon dioxide produced and the oxygen absorbed by respiration, that's known as the compensation point because obviously respiration releases CO2, photosynthesis takes in CO2. So if that's the same rate, we've got the compensation point. Now remember, plants respire too. You need to know that plants respire too. At the compensation point, there will be no net gain or loss of gases. Now, normally CO2 is the limiting factor in plants, which I mentioned earlier, but it's bears saying twice because it's important. Carbon dioxide makes up around 0.04% of our atmosphere. I think it's about 0.041% of our atmosphere. And 78% of the stuff you're breathing in and out of your lungs is nitrogen which is a fairly inert gas. In fact, it's so inert, supermarkets fill, fill their salad bags with nitrogen to stop it rotting. 20.95% is oxygen and 0.93% is argon with trace amounts of other Nobel gases. Studies have found that higher concentrations of carbon dioxide increase crop yields. And that's why some farmers add carbon dioxide to greenhouses that grow things such as tomatoes. An interesting study though by NASA, this really blew my mind actually, because we talk about rising CO2 levels being damaging for the planet. They actually found with rising CO2 levels that you will get a rise in temperature, which will mean more water will be in gas form. But plants battle this by actually reducing transpiration. So that's something interesting there, but a nuance to the debate. More CO2 means more substrate for Rubisco to combine with RUBP. That's going to happen in the Calvin cycle. Again, watch my video on the light independent reaction after this one for more information there. Now, if CO2 and light is in plentiful supply, an increase in temperature will lead to a direct increase in the rate of photosynthesis, because if we've got plenty of CO2 and plenty of light, temperature will be the limiting factor. Now, really fascinatingly, 
is that between 0 and 25 degrees Celsius, a 10 degree increase in temperature will actually double the rate of photosynthesis. So it will double the rate that organic molecules can be produced by the plant. And we'll be able to measure that as a doubled rate of output of oxygen or absorption of carbon dioxide. These three graphs really nicely show what happens with the limiting factors. So with light intensity, assuming that's the limiting factor, it will increase as the light intensity increases. So the rate of photosynthesis will increase as the light intensity increases until light is no longer the limiting factor, at which point it will then plateau. Carbon dioxide is a similar story. As the carbon dioxide increases in concentration, so does the rate of photosynthesis until another factor is limiting, such as light or temperature, at which point it plateaus. Okay. Now, temperature is a slightly different story. As the temperature increases, so will the rate of photosynthesis until we reach an optimum rate where there's so much kinetic energy between enzymes and substrates with more frequent chances of successful collisions and forming enzyme substrate complexes. But after a certain temperature, Rubisco will denature, and that's going to lead to a decreased rate of reaction. Not to mention things like protein channels and carrier proteins and all that good stuff denaturing too. So temperature does have a point where it just kind of plummets and the rate of photosynthesis decreases. So how would we describe these graphs? Well, for light intensity, let's take that as an example. A good example of a description would be that there's an initial proportional increase. So as the light intensity increases, so does the rate of photosynthesis, followed by a slowing of the rate of increase and then a plateau. If we were going to explain these, we would say light is no longer the limiting factor when it plateaus. But when it was increasing, we had that proportional increase, light was the limiting factor. So therefore more light would lead to more photoionization, which would lead to more ATP, which would lead to more NADPH, which would lead to more Calvin cycle turns and therefore more glucose and therefore more, you know, carbon dioxide use, all that good stuff. Now, this is another graph and you will see this in the exam. I've seen a few past paper questions that have this. So you're given rate of photosynthesis on the y-axis and light intensity on the x-axis. So the thing you're changing on the x, the thing you're measuring on the y, as always. So experiment one, we had 25 degrees, 0 0.1 carbon dioxide concentration. Experiment two, we had 25 degrees Celsius, 0.041% carbon dioxide concentration so we had same temperature less co2 and experiment three which was 15 degrees 0.041 percent co2 and experiment three obviously has a, a lower temperature so we can see the one that has the highest temperature and the highest carbon dioxide concentration progresses at the fastest rate so you could think about describing the the graph as well so describing it, you talk about the initial increase and then the plateau. You talk about how experiment two increases and plateaus at a higher rate than experiment three. Experiment one increases and plateaus at a higher rate than experiment two. There are descriptions done. And if you had some figures, you'd quote the numbers as well. So to explain these graphs, we say that experiment one has a higher temperature than experiment three. So there's more kinetic energy, more enzyme substrate complexes, more carboxylation of our UBP to GP. For CO2, we would say that there's more substrate, therefore more carboxylation of our UBP, therefore more turns of the Calvin cycle, therefore a faster rate of photosynthesis. And if we really wanted to get into detail, we could talk about how more NADP would be generated and ADP, which go to the light-dependent reaction, which will allow the process to carry on at a faster rate, okay? So a few questions here. So first of all, how could we find out the rate of photosynthesis? So pause this video and, and answer these. Number two, what is limiting the rate of photosynthesis at the beginning for experiment one? 
And number three, if there are low levels of sunlight, e.g. in winter, why would it not be cost effective for a farmer to heat a greenhouse? So have a think about that, come up with your answers. So question one, how would we find out the rate of photosynthesis? So we'd measure the volume of CO2 absorbed or the volume of oxygen produced. Question two, what is the limiting factor for photosynthesis at the beginning for experiment one? The answer here is light intensity as an increase in light, which is our x-axis, our independent variable, leads to an increase in photosynthesis, even though temperature and CO2 levels are controlled. Okay. If there are low levels of sunlight, e.g. in winter, why would it not be cost effective for a farmer to heat a greenhouse? And then we would say, because light would limit the rate of the light dependent reaction slash Calvin cycle, because obviously if we don't have the light dependent reaction, we don't have ATP and NADP. Question three, if there are low levels of sunlight, e.g. in winter, why would it not be cost effective for a farmer to heat a greenhouse? So the answer here is because light would limit the rate of the light dependent reaction. So we'd have less NADPH being formed and less ATP being formed. That would therefore limit the Calvin cycle. So an increase in temperature would not increase the rate of photosynthesis because there simply wouldn't be enough reduced NADP for the reduction of GP to TP and then ATP for GP to TP and ATP for TP back to our UBP. So guys, to summarize, photosynthesis is limited by light, CO2 and temperature. Higher temperatures give Rubisco more kinetic energy and therefore a higher chance of a successful collision between enzyme and substrate, which is RUBP and CO2 and Rubisco. Now the key term is enzyme substrate complexes. AQA, love to see you thread that in the exam. It comes up all the time in the mark schemes. Next, increased light intensity will lead to greater levels of photoionization. So remember, that's where chlorophyll, photo meaning light, light hits the chlorophyll. It becomes ionized as the electrons leave it. It will then become positively charged. Okay. Therefore, more photophosphorylation because as the electrons pass down the electron transport chain. By the way, watch my video on the light dependent reaction after this video for more knowledge on that if you haven't already. So more photophosphorylation where ATP gets produced through the electron transport chain when those protons are flowing through ATP synthase and more reduction of NADP for the Calvin cycle. This will all lead to an increased rate of photosynthesis. Next, higher CO2 concentrations lead to more substrate for Rubisco, therefore more enzyme substrate complexes, massively key word guys, key term rather and therefore a faster rate of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is limited by the factor that is least favorable at any given time. So watch another video, like it, and let me know what do you need to revise next, guys, because I'm gonna be producing content based on what you need. I'll see you in the next one.